to wrap up that season, uh, the, you're playing for the Vernon Vipers. Yeah. You go to the league final against Surrey. You lose in the league final, and this is the team party. And you're yeah, we went and had our fire. we went and had our bender that we used to do. Right, I don't know what the kids do now, but that's what we did. We'd go party for a week, and it was like day two, I think, of this this week party. And and yeah, so to, to even go back further and and you like to what type of player I was, but more what type of person I was, and uh. You're a reckless player. Is that? I was. Re- I, that's yeah. I was, yeah. I, I was definitely reckless, uh, and that in a way that every coach appreciates, right? And that carried off, uh, carried you know itself off the ice as well. So for me, I look back now and I realized a lot of it was, you know, I like the adrenaline of doing crazy things. Uh, yeah. You know, you get attention that way, and when you're young and attention, and you know, it's all good. <laughs> but you're feeding a young ego, which I can look back now and you're, there's that, as, sure. there's that aspect of feeding that. And I think for me too, there was an, an element of just living up to that stereotypical fighter. I'm like, I got to be this crazy guy. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's, a, I think a lot of where that came from. And then being a pyro and messing around with gas and fire was for me, a part of that. And just was reckless and, and careless at this party. And one thing led to another. And I, you know, had a lot of gas accidentally spilt on myself from a, a stunt gun wrong. And, and just, I blew up basically. So you're putting on a show gas yeah. fire, you catch fire and then, um, yeah. and then so, it's a drive to, uh, was it a, a girl, a teammate's girlfriend rips you to the ER in Vernon and then yeah. you're in a helicopter yeah. shortly after. Yeah, exactly. So I was, I was basically like making my own spin off a Molotov cocktail. So I would like fill up what, what did I had was I had a Colt 45, the OG big bottle yeah. and the empty, yeah. an empty wine bottle, <laughs> both full of gas. Right. So not smart, but again, I just, we just said about, you know, I'm, I'm feeding this ego attention and I'm doing yeah. stupid shit and everything's all fun until someone gets hurt. Right. And that's, that's what happened. And, the bottom. And everybody listening to this can relate to that in some way right. where they're like, man, I got away with something. Oh, yeah. We all life. think we're invincible yeah. at that age, right? Yeah. And I absolutely thought that. And uh, so I had ran through like a few beer-sized bombs, essentially. And I was going to blow these big ones up. And I'm walking around the party and the bottoms of the bottles had hit. So I had them in my sweater pocket and the, the bottoms hit each no other and way. broke. So I had a liter and a half of gas on me and uh, yeah, like a few minutes went by and I'm picking out the glass out of my pocket. And yeah, to this day, I don't know why I threw the sweater in the fire. I think, you know, maybe I just didn't want to litter and leave it on the ground or I thought, well, I might as well just, you know, light the sweater on fire. I reek like gas. I just, I got to get this thing off. Now I know there's a fire there. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, we've been drinking, but I, I still think I kept a safe distance away and I gave it a toss and kind of gave the ground a kick and like a detonator cord to dynamite that, that flame just kind of followed me and went, I just didn't respect the dangers of, you know, the gasoline and the vapors, right. With all of it. And, and up I went. Oh my God. Um, you know, like going back to just like, I remember when I heard about it, and so like I said, I was, I was 24 first, like head coaching gig, mm-hmm. probably like a lot of people at it. You feel like you got it all figured out because, yeah. you know, experience doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Yeah. But I remember hearing about it and it just, it dawned on me in that moment. Um, I was like, oh my God, like I'm responsible for these 22 teenagers, kids I'm recruiting to leave their home for what happens. And I was like, man, you just never think about that vulnerability as, as a right. coach or a leader that, that environment you set, because every, like every team did exactly their version yeah. of what you just described the camp trip on going on the bender. Absolutely. And, um, and you know, I think that that's probably one area where our game is probably in it for all the right ways is saying that, Hey, like as fun as that is, um, you know, as long as that's a part of our culture, like we're going to, you know, yeah. sh- shit's going to get real occasionally. It's, and these are, it's changed for the, blind. yeah. Change for the better. I think we have a ways to go still because Yeah. I mean, there is an element of, I think hockey, maybe, 
I don't know if you could call it exacerbates some of those behaviors, right? But I, I still think there's an element of being young and feeling invincible and just being aware and cognizant of maybe some repercussions of, of some of those actions, right? So, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. But, uh, um, yeah. So, I, so, so you're in the hospital. So, I have this and, talk, um, talk with the, the doctor, right? To pick back. Uh, where we left off. Yeah. So he, so basically he's, he tells me this and in my head, I'm like, well, I have camp in three and a half months, three and a half months here or whatever. Right. So this happened in April and our camp is end of August or whatever. Right. Four months. And yeah, I ask the doctor that and he, (laughs) I'll never forget the look on his face. He just froze and, was like this, I could tell he's thinking this poor kid thinks he's going to play hockey again. And he just said, listen, these, these recoveries can take years, not months. So you're not going to be playing hockey in a few months. Like you're going to be in here for, for a while. And we'll look at getting you in a pair of skates, like down the road in a non-competitive environment. That was the dialogue. So for me, my career was over at that point. And I had accepted that. Right. So, but you played, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, you played the home opener yeah, I did. that year. Yeah. So this is in no way to make light of it, but when you talk about the skin grafts and just the amount of rehabilitation you'd have to go through. So I'm not naming any names, but I got some buddies right now that are either considering or have had like the skin graft thing on your head where you're losing your hair. Oh, like, and they, like they gra- yeah, the implants, right? Oh, okay. And so that injury, so the, the biggest part is they're like, man, like I basically have to go hide for like a month <laughs> because I can't really do anything. And I, you know, I, I look goofy. Yeah. But in my mind, I'm like, man, like there's this controlled environment, the surgery, like that is like a month recovery where you don't step outside. You're dealing with something where it's like your entire body yeah. has been engulfed in flames three and a half months. Um, like, what did you need to do? To, to get to a point where you were able to play, like what kind of like milestone did you have to reach from a healing perspective? Cause I mean, I mean yeah, I mean, science is science, I would think when it comes to this stuff. So this is, this is like the meat of the story is, and like yeah. where my, what my book's really about it, and especially the first half where, so that was my, my first two weeks in the burn unit was, was that my career's over. What the hell am I going to do with the rest of my life? You know, uh, but on the other hand, I was thankful that I was alive and that I was going to live somewhat of a normal life as a burn survivor. And I was, again, my face yeah. wasn't going to be mangled. I could live, you know, a relatively lo- normal life. So that all changed when I got a call from Vandy, my coach, two weeks into my, st- camp, yeah. into my stay. He called me and she said, you know, how you doing? And I said, well, you know, been better, but <laughs> hanging in there. <laughs> Yeah, And uh, he said, I, he was just talking with the assistant coach from Brown university and they're looking for his exact words were he, they told me we want a guy to put the fear of God in the defenseman of the Ivy league, which as you know, that was my job basically. Yeah, totally. And he said, I get the perfect guy for you. There's just one major problem. You know, he's laid up in the burn unit and the future doesn't look great, which was an understatement at that point. Yeah. So he said, they want to talk to you. Like, I know you got the time, just give them a call. So, I mean, to paint the picture, I'm still wrapped like a mummy in the burn unit. Can't move. How did you, can you, can you hold the phone up? To no, you, like, when you have that no, my hands phone. are fully wrapped. So my, Jeez. my parents, my parents take down this guy's number and they stick the phone in my ear and my shoulder. And I'm like, I'm laid up again, like a mummy. My face is now uncovered. So that first week it was like, full mummy nothing and so now my face had showing and uh put the the phone there and i talked to this coach from brown and hear my first rhode island accent which was interesting yeah (laughs) and yeah it was left super open-ended they just said we're sorry to hear what happened we wish you the best in recovery and you know maybe we'd see a play one day down the road kind of thing but both of us knowing i have one year left of eligibility yeah so We hang up the phone and I remember just, it was a very emotional moment with my mom and dad because, you know, I had worked my whole life to talk to one of these guys and I I hadn't talked to one NCAA scout because they weren't exactly recruiting fighters. 
right? But I had slowly added a few layers and I just figured, man, like if I- And you could skate. I could skate. And I, yeah. and I figured I had one more year left. I was confident, especially playing in Vernon, that I could go get a scholarship somewhere. Maybe it was Div 3. I didn't really care. Yeah. Um, yeah. So again, hadn't talked to one scout. And finally, I'm like, I had finally done it. And look where I am. Like, look what I've done to myself and my career is now over. And that's where it all changed. And I started asking questions. So I, yeah, and I, I've got, and I've got a lot of questions about this period. And the first one is like, just, you know, given the story you told about your dad um, with the bully when you were younger and, and I, and I, I mean, for all of us that are parents, like just hearing this story gives you anxiety. Right. And um, because I mean, that's the worst call any parent can get. How did your parents assist you mentally? And I'm sure at this point, they're not thinking about Brown or hockey or the NHL or any of no. that. They're just trying to help their son get through this. How did they just talk to you and, and, and help guide you through this process? And, and I'm obviously giving you a lot of strength. Yeah, just, I mean, at the first few weeks, it was just them being there. They never, they never left my side, right? They went into a lot of debt. Uh, when I was in there, they didn't because they didn't work. Never thought, oh, yeah, right. And I never thought about wow. that either. And they're like, we lost a lot of money. <laughs> and my parents were very, you know, middle class, and we didn't have a ton. Um, yeah, but wow, yeah. So that was something I never had totally really grasped. But just again, the support of just being there was so huge. I mean, I told them after you know even that third week, I started to feel a little bit better. I'm like, you guys can go. I'm okay. And they're like, you know, we're not leaving you. Right. And so we talk about support even further from that. So yeah, I have this call and I, that's when I started asking why. So, okay, they're telling me I can't play hockey again. So why? What's, what's the reason? And there was a really big long list of great reasons why. I mean, infection was probably the biggest. Uh, yeah. The skin grafts are going to be like fresh, limiting, painful, those things take a while to heal by nature. Um, I had to wear a full body suit for two years. I, you can't sweat. No way. You can't sweat from the grafted areas, right? So if you're talking like, again, at that time, we didn't know, was I 20% grafts, 40, 30? Like we didn't really totally know yet. Um, somewhere yeah. in the, somewhere between that. So if you're creeping up to like 30 plus 40 percent grass and you're talking about getting your heart rate up there's complications there if you can't sweat right so anyways the yeah, list no the list just went on and on and on and and i meant like this list of things are things that are out of your control for the most part like these are right. just yeah the, the nature of the injury you've got. for yeah. the most part yeah. yeah and so in my head i'm basically hearing like you're telling me it's going to hurt too much is what i heard right and I mean, the infection piece, I was like, well, I'll just deal with that if that if the time comes. And and then I thought it can't be worse than than what I had just been through for the last two weeks. How can it hurt more than that? I mean, that was a little bit naive thinking, but that's what I thought. <laughs> right. Being legit lit on fire, like then the pain associated with with that, you know, again, I didn't think it could get worse than that. So I that's when I, I made the choice in that burn unit, I had this epiphany that I was going to come back and, and play hockey and go to Brown. And like, I was truly like that clear, like that specific. Yeah. So there wasn't this gradual buildup. Like I, like you'd asked at the beginning, right. It was, this is my decision. And I think, you know, there's a lot of power in just, this is the choice and sticking by that. My mindset at that point was I'm willing to die before giving up here. It really was. If you are involved with the minor hockey association that hosts tournaments or multiple tournaments, or you're a coach who operates spring tournaments or any organization that puts on events, then you're going to thank me for introducing you to Event Connect. Event Connect makes managing and growing your sports events simple and efficient. It literally covers every aspect of the event management from scheduling, uh, linking out of town teams or visitors with hotel bookings to capturing registration fees and collecting additional revenue all on one platform. Best of all, it's free. Event Connect receives a small fee through its payment processor, but there is no upfront investment. 
I got introduced to Event Connect because several of our league and association partners began using them and raved about the time it saved, how user-friendly it was, and the additional revenue they were able to generate. In fact, the feedback was so positive, we began using Event Connect to host TCS Live, our annual coaching conference at the University of Michigan. It was a great decision. I know firsthand how stressful it can be to run tournaments and events and can't imagine going through that process again without Event Connect. If you want to simplify the process of organizing your tournament or event and tap into new revenue, then go to eventconnectsports.com to book a demo today. Don't go through the painful process of trying to run your next tournament without Event Connect. Go to eventconnectsports.com and get started now.